funny how we're going into offensive stuff and putting oneself out there. That makes me, you know, I, I kind of wanted to share this. Is this something just happened to me this week? And I, I just thought I'd share it because I think it's a fun story. I don't do story yeah. time often, but I feel like this is this is a fun story time. Um, okay. I was I was doing my walk. You know, you I, I like doing walks because um, I like, you know, I like being in shape, uh, trying to get in shape and saying hi to people. And I don't know. It's a good time for quiet meditation and reflection. And I came across um, Black Mustang, and uh, I looked at its license plate. It had, you know, license plates have a, a border or um, an outline on it that sometimes says things. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this one said "Hail Satan." Oh yeah, I heard about this. Go ahead. Yeah, you probably heard about it from my wife because I told my yeah. wife afterwards. I did, but go ahead. And I. I was so angry. I absolutely, I was enraged. I mean, the, the, the sheer audacity to publicly do that. Windy Fields, by the way. Um, but um, everyone knows it's windy. But um, I, I thought, you know what? I, I'm because I, I actually thought about Father Ripperger. Father Ripperger had this thing where. He talks about possessions, and, and one of the things about possessions is, is, you know, when the person is fighting against it, it they're doing prayers or doing acts, um, which are causing that person to be more sanctified, and it's actually yeah. mortifying. It's actually punishing the devil because the devil's possession is actually causing this person to become holier, right? Yeah. So, the devil's involvement is 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 creating a, a good in a sense, as a reaction to it. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is this is for you, Satan. And then I, I did, um, I, I did a, a handful of St. Michael prayers. Um, but then I thought, you know, this it's just not enough. It's just absolutely not enough. And so um, I did the most outlandish thing I could think of, but outlandish not for the sake of being outlandish, but outlandish for representing my love of God. And um, I walked through the downtown, uh, crowded, um, and I sang as loud as I could. Actually, I, I had it on repeat because I was walking a lot of places, but I sang as loud as I could the credo in Latin as I was walking. I just I just belted it out, um, and everyone was looking at me for some reason. Um, uh, but you know, but I wasn't angry as I was singing. If that makes any no. sense, I I I because yeah. the credo in Latin is actually one of my favorite songs. I, I mean, it is my favorite song to sing, and because it's just there's something about it that just it comes out of you. Credo number one. The the yeah. tune the tune I think is credo number I I like credo number credo one. In exactly Deo. exactly yeah. that that version so um that's the tune I was doing it to um and yeah I don't know I I just you know I wonder you know all the people who are so indifferent to this satanic creep in all cultural aspects all the people who are so indifferent I I wonder if they're bothered by sort of godly acts like that like oh you know i don't know what he's saying but it's god stuff oh i don't like that i don't mind the hail satan and all the demonic stuff and and the demonic influence everywhere else but that 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 weird language i mean he's saying deum i think that means god in some language yeah. uh, dutch dutch or something so it was one of those things where in some some aspect of me enjoyed being offensive. Some aspect of me enjoyed having the courage to do that. Um, you know, in the back of your mind, too, it's honestly California. So it's like that's what I always tell myself. Like, this is California. People don't care. And I always tell myself when I'm on the street, I can say whatever I want. People are cowards. They're not going to say anything to me. No, They're just going to think thoughts. But they won't say anything. And that, I, I mean, you discovered one of the great secrets of life which is that everybody is scared. Yeah, yeah. And so if you're not, you suddenly acquire a power over the situation. 
Um, but you know, one of the things I, I find very it's it's amazing what people accept and go for. Uh, one of the things that hit me recently was when uh, they were going out about how China is going to change its one-child policy to a two-child policy. It doesn't seem to disturb anyone that any government on this planet has that kind of power over you. That's wrong. And from the time they imposed that, way, way back in the 90s or 80s, whenever it was, you didn't hear anybody protest. Our government sure didn't. You didn't have anybody say, this is an assault on human dignity. Yeah. And you know why they didn't? Money? Partly. There's another reason. What? Racism. There are already too many Chinese. I guarantee you a lot of people in their heart of hearts, maybe not even consciously, felt that way. Well, God, there are already too many Chinese. Wow. Well, I know the NBA had the thing where they wouldn't say anything about China because China's a big part of their revenue stream. Um, but, yeah, uh, so I'm they, sure uh, – I, I believe the racist thing, sure. No, I, I, I'm quite serious. I mean, the, the racist thing is why nobody really cares about crime in black neighborhoods. Nobody cares that the largest single cause of death among young black males is other young black males. Nobody cares about that. You know. Oh, yeah, there's racism is alive and well in our society. Don't think otherwise. It's just it's not what the critical race theory people say it is. In fact, the critical race theory people themselves are an example of racism because they think that people of color are incapable yeah. So I mean, you, you remember that famous list of white traits that have been foisted on uh, on people of color that the Smithsonian Institute came up with? Things like, you know, keeping a schedule and planning for later. <laughs> yeah, that that's that, that that can't even get legs. That that's just immediately like self destructive. Like that's. But it's, it reflects their minds. Yeah. They're little tiny brains that think that the brains of colored people, people of color, are as small as their own brains are. Well, believe you me, you doctors of critical race theory, uh, the average person of color has far more brains than you will ever achieve in your entire little career. So... Yeah, I mean, the moral of the story, honestly, to me, what I I'm, I'm I'm trying to sort of ride that wave because I feel like that was a good reaction, and it was that a good was good reaction, and you've yeah, got to keep it. Exactly, that's the whole thing. It, is realizing that I'm indifferent too. Like like when no. God talks about in, man's indifference in the Bible, that's like everybody, not just everybody other than me. That's me. So I need no. to like keep doing that. And, you know, I just encourage everyone to, to, to do to, to, to ride those moments where something tugs at you. God put that there so you can you could use that, you know, and you can and you could do something, even if it seems small. You know, I um, I remember when uh, way back in 2014, when they were going to have the black mass at Harvard oh, and that. The uh, well, it turned into a brilliant victory for the uh, for the church, but what what I thought was wonderful about it, because uh, you know there were three different groups doing different things in response. There was a group of about eighty people who were actually praying outside the hall where the black mass was supposed to take place. They were saying the rose. There were only about eighty of them, because there's a limit on how many outsiders can you know be on the Harvard lawn at any moment, but. They were there, and in the end, they didn't do it at Harvard at all. Then there were about a thousand people in St. Paul's Church in Harvard, or in uh, Cambridge, right outside in the Harvard, uh, in the Harvard Square. Um, the um, about a thousand people for the Holy Hour of Reparation, including 
the president of Harvard, Dr. Faust. <laughs> yeah, you went there, I remember. Well, I went there, but I was I didn't start there. I was with the other thousand people who were doing the Eucharistic procession through the streets of Cambridge from MIT to uh, St. Paul's. And it was, and part of the way I got to carry one of the sticks of the canopy, which was great. But I mean, cars were honking, people were waving, people were falling to their knees. Uh, and then there was this mass of Hispanics with banners and so forth. <clears throat> and they were from coming from another direction. And they, there had been no coordination between them and us, but they were obviously, you know, can we join you? And we said, yeah, sure. And they did. You know, they had their banners of Our Lady of Guadalupe and things like that. They all, they all jumped in. And this whole mass of people went into Harvard Square. And I got to tell you, I have not seen Harvard Square that full since the anti-war protests in the, in the 60s when I was a little boy. I, I have not seen it that crowded, that wall to wall. And then we went in the 80. The 80 people who had been praying joined us. And then we went in to St. Paul's. So you had over 2,000 people crammed into St. Paul's. I remember when that happened. I remember that was such an unbelievable experience. I remember you said things like, this is the future of the church. All you know, young people of all their varieties, just everybody. I don't know. I'm and, so jealous that I wasn't there. I wish I was. Oh, well, I tell you, it was uh it was one. It was just wonderful. Bliss it was to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Uh it it and and again, the man responsible for it, Father Dre, he uh what an amazing coup he pulled off. Cuz it could so easily have been screwed up in any one of a number of ways. He did it perfectly. And everybody played their played their part time. So when it was all over, everyone's leaving. He comes out, I'm standing on the porch, which was his Charles. And I said, Father, I said, we are met at Philippi. <laughs> so, but no, I, um, I, uh, I, I thought to myself, the faith is not dead, even in Cambridge. <laughs> 